Welcome to the San Francisco Writers Conference podcast, celebration of craft, commerce, and community. I'm your host, Matthew Felix, and I'm here today with Lit Quake's Jack Bulware and Alia Volz. And today we're going to focus again on that last one in the list, community. Specifically, we're going to talk about Lit Quake, which is a huge literary event that not only brings together writers and lovers of the written word here in the Bay Area, but elsewhere, not only in the country, but even elsewhere in the world, like England, Ireland, New Zealand, and other places. But let me introduce our guests before we talk about Litquake. Jack Bulware is a San Francisco Library Laureate, a journalist and author of three books, Sex American Style, San Francisco Bizarro, and the Bay Area Punk Oral History, Give Me Something Better. He has written for the San Francisco Weekly, Playboy, and the New York Times Magazine. He has also been a contributor to Wired, Business 2.0, and Salon, where he contributed a daily column called Naked World. Jack also happens to be, along with Jane Ganahl, co-founder of Litquake. Regular listeners and viewers of this podcast might recall that Alia Volz was my first guest when we talked about her memoir, Home Baked, My Mom, Marijuana, and the Stoning of San Francisco. I still love that title. Winner of the 2020 Golden Poppy Award from the California Independent Booksellers Alliance. Alia's work has been published in the Best American Essays, the New York Times, and the best women's travel writing and elsewhere. Her unusual family story has been featured on Snap, Judgment, Criminal, and NPR's uh, Fresh Air. Welcome, Jack and Alia. Thank you. Thank you. So, Jack, let's start at the beginning. Uh, For those who don't already know, can you just give us kind of the high-level overview of what Litquake is? Sure. Uh, Litquake is... As far as we know, the longest running literary festival in San Francisco. This is our 22nd year. We were writers and we formed it 22 years ago. We did a, an afternoon of readings in Golden Gate Park at the Ben Shell, having uh, zero idea of what we were doing. And uh, it turned out uh, so popular. It turned to be uh, in, uh, and resonated so strongly with people that we just kept doing it and it grew organically because of the interest in, uh, from the community. And so, uh, you know, pre pandemic, uh, I think one of our, uh, festivals had 900 authors in, uh, uh 10 days. Oh and, um, with the pandemic, we, uh, we did a virtual festival last year that was much more scaled down. And this year we decided to do some live events, but I think 900 authors is kind of a thing of the past. That's, that's, um, we have maybe 300 this year, but we have a full 16 day schedule and there are plenty of events for uh, people who are interested in all different sorts of genres. We have a film screening, we have live events, we have recorded events, we have outdoor events and we have indoor events. And uh, uh, Ollie is uh, uh, going to be part of uh, several events too. So that uh, it's great that she is here today to join us. It is indeed. And I think if I recall correctly, the original idea came, you and Jane were sitting in a bar. Is that correct? Is that where the idea was actually hatched? Oh, you want to go that far back? Okay. I just love uh, that. I love that part of the origin story. Uh, yes. The Edinburgh Castle pub, which is a Scottish pub in the Tenderloin. And it was sort of a hangout for uh, um, a lit scene, sort of. Nobody really knew what it was, but that was where we decided to uh, to do a festival, and uh, it came out of just the, the sort of the occasional readings that went on there. Um, and so uh, that was our office for several years. We would just have organizational meetings in the Edinburgh Castle Pub, and and then it became a venue. We used it as a venue for many years. Ferling Getty read at Lickquake at the Edinburgh Castle. Um, Irvin Welsh. Uh, it was it was great fun. It was. Uh, the style of literary events that originated at that bar, I think, have forever influenced what happened in Lickwick afterwards. Because you uh, you could stand because there weren't enough seats, and uh, in a in a uh, sleazy bar in the Tenderloin, and have a drink in your hand, and hear someone reading, and you look out over the crowd, and everyone would have a drink in their hand, and they all be smiling. <laughs> And it was uh, it was so different than, um, you know, some uh, literary events where you're sitting in a folding chair and the fluorescent lights are on and uh, you're not sure if you should stand up and go to the bathroom or not. And, you know, this was a much more loosey goosey, fun kind of uh, vibe. 
right. uh, that we we learned from just sort of hanging around Edinburgh Castle. So um, yeah, there's a little bit of like Scottish pub in every Lickwake event. In every event. And I think you and I actually read together at was probably the last literary event at the pub because it closed shortly after when we read at Francis Stroh's Stranger Than Fiction. I think that was probably the last literary event because it oh, closed it shortly was, after. It was one of the last. Apparently it is open again, but there oh, are really? uh, different managers running it. And um, yeah, we, we looked into it to to maybe see if we could bring a liquid back there for one event. And it was just didn't work out. It didn't, it didn't seem like it was going to happen. So well, I didn't realize they had opened back up again, but um, so before, so thanks for going back that far, because like uh, I said, yeah, it is, like, uh, it is a great, it is a great origin name. story showing your yes. Uh, but I just want to throw out two stats that I think are really telling as well. So per your website to date, because you mentioned the 900 authors that you had a um, year or two ago, but overall to date, according to your website, more than 10,000 authors overall, and 250,000 attendees have participated in the festival. So I think that just speaks to, you know, the massive success it is. So, so thanks for making that happen. So Alia, I heard that you had some big issues with how Jack and Jane run things, and that's why you decided to get involved. Do you want to speak to some of those? <laughs> Hang on. I, thought, I thought they needed someone to crack the whip. Um, <laughs> and so you were the person. Apparently, yeah. Um, I'll 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 fill any empty space. Um, no, but I'm I'm really thrilled uh, as always to be in, involved with Liquid. I was thinking about what Jack was saying about how it began at the Edinburgh Castle and how much a, a part of the the ethos of Liquid that is. And and really, it's one of the things that I love most about this festival and the fact that we have it in our in our city is that it gets authors and readers out from stuffy environments. It get auth gets authors out from behind podiums. It gets readers out of their chairs. And, and it's just got this wonderful interactive feeling that over the years has evolved and, and changed with the times. And it's really an, an opportunity with so many wonderful events happening over the short period of time. It's really an opportunity not only to interact with authors and, and genres of writing that you know and love, but to expand your horizons, try something different and in a weird environment. I mean, yes. um, it's a little different this year, but in the past, there have been readings in laundromats. There, mm -hmm. Of course, there are readings in bars and, uh, and, and now we have readings in Zoom rooms. Um, still, it's the offerings are so diverse and interesting that um, I, I always love to encourage people to get out of their comfort zone as far as attending. Absolutely. Yes. And we're going to talk about a lot of the diversity in that programming and that's the different the different uh, offerings that are that are available. But, you know, Alia, you just mentioned changing times. And so, Jack, I want to ask you a question along those lines. When I first asked or rather when I first interviewed Jane in 2018, we talked about a 2004 statistic uh, that at the time, at least, San Franciscans spent twice as much as the national average on books and booze. Now, that was a long time ago. I don't know if that's still the case, but I'm wondering <clears throat> with all of the changes in our here in the city and the, 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 uh, the gentrification, the soaring cost of living, writers and artists and other creatives, so many having to leave because it is it does get has gotten more and more challenging, not even talking about the pandemic, which is obviously a completely different issue. Is San Francisco still a unique place insofar as literature and literary community is concerned? I think it always will be. I mean, we've, we've certainly had, uh, we did an event about this all, uh, earlier this year uh, <laughs> about how San Francisco is changing. Um, I think there will always be room in this city, in this, cult, in this uh, Bay Area culture for people who want to try something new want to change their name, want to move here and reinvent themselves, want to suddenly become a fiction writer at the age of 65, um, want to, um, there's this freedom here. There's a sort of a, in some, in some ways, it's a lack of critical analysis, but that also, uh, it, it fosters this sort of an inclusivity that not a lot of um, other regions of the country necessarily have. And uh, so you can find your tribe here. You know, right. you can definitely uh, jump into a community and just sort of surf around and poke around until you find like-minded individuals. And um, they'll be enthusiastic about what you're doing. They right. will be uh, encouraging and um, uh, 
so that's that's always been a, an element of uh, of what we do at the festival uh, is to sort of keep that uh, and that quirkiness of San Francisco. Um, like uh, Olya said, doing readings on a laundromat. Um, you know, we've, we've done so many bizarre sort of events. We did a uh, um, a dance party goth hop with gothic literature readings and a I DJ. missed that one. Darn uh, it. We did a tribute to uh, best selling nineteen eighties literature with readings from Tama Janowitz and uh, uh, Brett Easton Ellis. And there was a solid gold dance troupe. A solid gold. Nice. Yeah, it was, nice. it was just, you know, uh, we, you know, we've had um, the residents, the art rock band play. Uh, they, they had a new novel a few years back. Um, we, we screened one of the first uh, screenings of black Klansman, the Spike Lee film. And we had the author from New Mexico uh, on stage talking about that. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's, as the, the nation becomes more aware of social justice issues, certainly Liquid is, uh, you know, we've, oh, we've always felt that, but now we are um, um, definitely focused on that even more. Even more. Yeah, we're yep. bringing a lot of people to help us curate events and make sure that uh, there's, a, there's um, you know, voices that are heard that right. don't usually get uh, uh, amplified by the traditional publishing landscape. All right. And we're going to talk about out loud a little later. Alia, any thoughts on that? I know we talked, we touched on this briefly because of course you touch on it briefly. You actually grew up in the city. Any yeah. thoughts on, you know, since you've been here from day one, kind of the changing landscape and the resilience in spite mm -hmm. of all the challenges um, of, of writers and creatives here in the city. Yeah. It, and it, it, it's very, it's very complicated. Obviously there are a lot of factors at work. Um, but one of the things as I, as I, sometimes get very frustrated with my hometown uh, as the cultural moment of today is not one that I relate to very well. Uh, so I sometimes get frustrated and I, I, I think I wanna get out of here, but honestly, one of the things that always goes through my head is, but Litquake is here yeah. and that there isn't another, yeah, thank you, Jack. Um, that there, there really isn't another place to go in this country where we can, where, where someone is bringing together um, hundreds of authors every year and creating this community community. And, and even outside of the month of October, there are of course other Liquake events throughout the year. But I think that the 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 vibe, the feeling of that has really made a stamp on, on San Francisco. So that um, even as you know the certainly the beat generation is long gone and various cultural movements have come and ended that have made this such uh a renowned, world renowned literary place, but Litquake is, has made it a renowned, world renowned literary place today. Right. And it, it remains relevant. Um, it can also be completely ridiculous. I, Jack, you were bringing back all kinds of memories um, from the, I think I got roped into the 80s night, but I will say that one of the very first Litquake events that I got roped into doing was Bob Calhoun's night of of World Wrestling Federation memoirs. That's right. And uh, I, I uh -huh. somehow got talked into dressing up in drag as uh, the nature boy, Slick Rick Flair. And I had full a full body orange paint <laughs> on and uh -huh. a blonde mullet. And I had absolutely the time of my life. So there's there are a lot of silly shenanigans that are part of it. But then at, at heart, there's this real... There's, there's a real earnest love of the art form that emerges through all of that. I think that one of the things that makes San Francisco special as opposed to the New York scene where maybe people take themselves a little bit more seriously is that here we can be ridiculous and you will get a gigantic crowd out for something silly like that. And you'll get a gigantic crowd out um, to hear the day's luminaries as well and, and relate to it on a more intellectual level. So it's a combination of highbrow, highbrow and lowbrow that, that's um, so profoundly San Francisco. I mean, that's San Francisco from the gold rush. Right. That's something that has, has just surged and surged and surged through all of the changes again and again, this kind of this ridiculousness and this seriousness of purpose that and how they combine. I'm sorry, I'm not in a controlled environment today. <laughs> that's okay. As long as you, as long as your well being is not threatened, that's fine. It sounded a little alarming. As long as you're okay. Uh, but yes, but thanks for that. Thanks for that, Alia.
And so, so Jack, you know, so we've just established that, um, you know, in your comments a second ago, you talked about, you know, people and Ali was just elaborating on this as well. Artists, creatives, we do figure it out and we do figure out a way to stay in the city in the Bay Area, despite the challenges, all those things, the cost of living and all the different changes um, and challenges. But that's kind of more at a personal level. But what about at the organizational level? Because the reality is not only do we have Lit Quake, we also do have the San Francisco Writers Conference. We do have the Bay Area Book Festival. So somehow, in spite of all these challenges, these organizations are able to survive. So Jack, can you just speak to that a little bit at sort of an organizational level, how you're able to, and maybe it's, it might be day to day, but I'm just curious your thoughts, your thoughts on that. And not talking about the pandemic again, which is another challenge I'm going to ask you about. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know why there's so many people interested in books in the Bay Area. <laughs> I mean, there, there are, uh, we have, or we used, there was a statistic that the most bookstores per capita uh, in America were in the Bay Area. And we have a very fierce organization of uh, Northern California Independent Booksellers Association. I think it uh, might have changed its name in the past few years, but... It's Caliba now, the California Independent Booksellers Association. Right, right. Okay. And new logo, I hope. <laughs> um, they, uh, they are um, very well organized just as an independent book, book organization. And, uh, you know, Independent Bookstore Day came out of the Bay Area. Um, you know, there are... Uh, there's a there's a lit crawl sort of version that takes place in the East Bay. Um, when we uh, did our 2019 festival, it was our 20th year. And so we actually did 20 events in 20 uh, cities around the Bay Area. And every single one of them was so excited to have a literary event and, uh, you know, places where there aren't usually a lot of literary events. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that, you know, you can... Um, why are there so many organizations? Well, also, you know, you're here in the Bay Area, so it's pretty easy to start one. You know, we have had, had this startup culture since the 1850s, when you think about it. Um, the fact that there's so much technology that started here, it's, it was already happening in the 70s and the 60s and the 50s. You know, it just wasn't around silicon chips yet, <laughs> you know. Um, and the reason there are so many tech companies here is that this is an environment that lets them do that. Right. It lets them create things and so um, and, and start businesses, you know, and unorthodox businesses. For instance, Alia's uh, family business, which she wrote their wonderful <laughs> memoir about. Uh, and I just met your father uh, the last weekend or two weeks ago. Um, I, it, it was so incredible to to uh, to learn about San Francisco of that era in the 70s when, you know, the parents of uh, Alia right here would start a marijuana brownie business. And a, yeah. and a business that's robust that you raised a family with and you paid employees, um, you know, that's, uh, yes. um, there's an entrepreneurial, you know, wackiness of, of the Bay Area. And, um, you know, if you wanted to start a bookstore right now somewhere in the Bay Area, you would get people to help you. People, right. people love to have a bookstore. In the Bay Area. And there, we've lost a lot of, of them in the past uh, 10 years or so, but. We've lost a lot of movie theaters too. It's just, you know, right. audience right. is changing a bit and how people um, parse, parse their information and entertainment. But uh, does that start to answer the question? Not even remotely. Could you try again? Uh, <laughs> no. Alia, any, anything to add? I'm, and maybe not, because I think you did already kind of touch on some of this, but anything to add? Um, 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 no, I mean, well, not really, but... Um, it, it is it is definitely and it isn't only in San Francisco kind of thing. And what Jack was saying about Sticky Fingers Brownies, my folks' business, I've I've often said and often thought that it couldn't have happened in any other place mm -hmm. uh, in in that era in the 1970s when it was so illegal that San Francisco was a place that would accommodate not only a wacky idea, but the expansion and enlargement of a wacky idea. The audience is here for it. Right. Even in as, as small as as San Francisco is, in in com, in comparison to other major metropolises, the San Francisco people are looking for something a little unusual. Right, and that's yeah, and I guess that's the common denominator to what both you and Jack just said. Is the the bottom line is you can't have these organizations unless you have the audience, and we have the audience that's supporting these kind of things. Thankfully. Okay, Jack. So I was holding off on the COVID thing, but we can't avoid the elephant in the room. So I, in your press release for this year's event, you said, quote, I feel like we've pivoted about 67 times 
since January of this year. I was surprised there's only 67. You also <laughs> noted, quote, we lost about six months of preparation time. And God only knows how much time and energy and preparation the, an event of this magnitude does take. Uh, so how can you tell us a little bit about what it's been like to, to not only survive COVID, but to, to respond and come out of COVID and still hold an event um, like you're doing this year, which is even more than last year? Well, it is strange to, uh, to not ever see the, your fellow employees. Mm -hmm. You know, we've done a festival for tw over 20 years. And, uh, you know, we, part of it, the way it worked was that you were in the same room together or that you could go out for drinks together or you could like, you know, have parties in your office and you could sort of just intermingle with the, uh, the literary community at large. Nothing, nothing, you know. So the fact that we did a festival last year on Zoom and never once met each other for an entire year was kind of insanity. Seriously. Um, so we have met each, uh, uh, met in person a few times this year. And, you know, like most of California, we thought June 15th, it was going to open up. This was going to be it. And we were gearing towards uh, a live festival, but most of the publishing community was still very hesitant. A lot of books were getting delayed. A lot of uh, book tours were not happening at all. And so we, we were trying, you know, it, and it, week to week it would change. Oh, well, some authors are on tour. Oh, no, they're not. Oh, books are going to be released in August. No, they're not. They're moved back to December. So every week uh, things would change. But finally, uh, and so in that, you know, six month period of time, we're all generally in a normal year, we are um, hooking up with authors on book tour. We're working with our publicists. We're trying to find out when we can be their leg of a Bay Area tour, you know, all of that sort of stuff and uh, and populate the long uh, the long lead time um, um, events that, that, you know, have to be booked uh, very early on. None of that happened. <laughs> uh, and June 15th, suddenly it happened. And then suddenly we are like trying to figure out, oh, who can we get? Who is going to be a touring? And then Delta hit. And then everybody was like, I'm not doing any of it. Right. So right. Call that all, we had to tear all that up and start over. So uh, the fact that we have um, as many live events as we do is kind of miraculous. A lot of the venues, some of these events, are, it's their very first event in two years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Will be for the Liquid Festival. Right. Um, a lot of places still aren't open yet. San Francisco, you know, we're uh, we're very good at being altruistic. And uh, and so when, you know, uh, everyone said, um shut it down we were what the first city in the united states to shut down i believe we had the exactly. cruise ship out at the golden gate past the golden gate bridge so and we were very very aware of how to do the right thing but then we were one of the last to reopen so yeah you know it took a big toll on everybody's psyche some of the buildings and um and so the fact that we have a festival that has half live events is uh kind of a miracle it's amazing. Yes, you know, uh, it is a miracle. There's, uh, there's a lot of outdoor stuff. We, we tried to find outdoor venues when, when and wherever possible so that people feel more comfortable. Um, and, you know, now, uh, so it's, it still changes every year. Vaccines are wearing off. Oh, you're going to need, you know, like, oh, my God. So, uh, yeah. It's hard to keep up. Uh, it is hard to keep up. And so we, we paid attention to what our venues required for entrance. And so everybody has to be vaccinated to attend the festival indoors. And, um, and you have to wear a mask indoors. Unless right. You're, you're drinking. And that, that's, that's all we can do. We, we, we can't do anymore. And, you know, somebody uh, uh, was mentioning how boring zoom can be uh, if you're watching zoom events, but here's this trick I found uh, since everybody's, or, you know, the writers at Liquid and they're talking about writing, don't look at the screen, just turn up the volume and walk away. It's like a very expensive radio in your house. You know? Right. You can right. Just look so do we think I've been thinking about this has come up a few times. Um, Alia, do we think the future of these events is hybrid? Because one thing is, you know, Jack was just talking about where a lot of us are tired of, of staring at the Zoom screen. Right. And we miss that in-person experience. And we're looking forward to, to that in-person in experience as they're slowly starting to happen again. But at the same time, as someone who does events and participates in events, it has been nice to be able to have people from all over the world show up, right? Um, and I think it's going to be kind of hard to let go of that, but we definitely want to meet in person. Any yeah. thoughts on, on what that's going to look like going forward? 
Well, I, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about it. <laughs> <laughs> any answers? If, I'm really looking for answers. <laughs> I don't know if any of them are cogent. You know, I was, I was really in the very first wave of COVID authors. My book came out on, on 420, which was an, an inside joke for my publisher. Um, but as it, as it happened was three weeks into San Francisco's lockdown. So uh, right up until the end, we had a huge indoor launch party planned, you know, who know who knew this was gonna happen? I had a 20 city book tour and uh, like a lot of authors found myself having to pivot extremely quickly. And Lit Quake was right there from the beginning. In fact, uh, Lit Quake threw an on a streaming launch party for Home Baked and it was one of the first it was one of the first uh, Zoom literary events. Um, it was very and, raw, too. I think you had a DJ, and I had a DJ. it was it was very uh, sort of you know. We had a dance party. It you was know? a dance was, party. Yeah, but really no body cool. slams. No body slams. There was no your Ric Flair days. Right. Yeah, nobody body slams when you're alone in your living room. But um, in the very early days of, of Zoom, it was all new and we were looking for ways to make it interesting. Do I do a slideshow? Do I do a, you know, an outdoor screening? Do I you know, bring in DJs? What do you do? How do you make it a drinking game? How do, you, how do you engage people in this weirdly distancing platform that we're working on? Um, over time, some of the really positive elements of that have emerged in being able, as you said, to do events with authors who are on the other side of the world. I got to do something with, with Armistead who lives in London now, you know, and, and so that aspect of it is really great. Also from an accessibility point of view, there are people who even outside of COVID for whatever reason, immune compromise or mobility impaired or whatever the situation is, aren't able to attend live events easily. Um, and it also opens attendance to an international market. So there, there are really some benefits that as an author who did a rather elaborate Zoom tour, um, as my, all from my home, you know, all from my, with like dressed up from here on up in pajamas from the waist down like everybody else. Um, but there, there really were some benefits. And so I can absolutely see a hybrid model like the one Liquake is developing now becoming kind of a regular thing. I know that right. in the, the event that we're doing in, in the alley, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in a moment later, but that there's a plan to film that so that it can also be available uh, online to people who are not present. And, and I think that that kind of a model really is a wave of the future. At the same time, it's been so wild to watch watch Lit Quake try and field the, the daily challenges of how do we make this so that it can be virtual or can be in person, depending on the numbers, mm -hmm. a week out. Right. And, and that, I mean, it's an organizational feat, um, the likes of which I only halfway can fathom myself. Um, right. Well, you have to be insane to, to continue to do this. Think of all the people you know who own bars, theaters, restaurants. Most of them are kind of insane. You kind of have to be a little nutty to, to enjoy it, to get something out of it. Um, for those of you who are watching or listening and you are wondering how to do a book tour on Zoom, you should all watch Alia's tour from last year. Just look at all the events that she did uh, and how she organized them and how she put them together and marketed them because it was astonishing. Nobody, I never saw, I'm, you know, we at Liquid, we look at, you know, authors and publishing trends and stuff all all the time. And here's Alia from San Francisco just creating out of thin air all these amazing events and marketing them uh, very successfully. I mean, a lot of them were very, very well attended. And, you know, it was uh, unproven ground. Nobody knew how to do this. And she was like a real trailblazer for all of 2020. Yeah. So people should, um, you know, uh, take heed and go to our website and, and see how, you know, glean the secrets because, um, you know, it, it's that's very, very helpful knowledge for anybody. Right. And as luck would have it, that is actually one of the reasons she was my first guest is because I saw that she had she she got kind of screwed by the pandemic. And so in so far as her launch was concerned, and then I saw that she was off. She had offered a course at one point about how to how to pivot. What can you do given this on un, these unforeseen circumstances? How can you make the most of them? And so that was half of our conversation actually was 
how do you do that? How do you launch under these just insane conditions? And she did do it so brilliantly. And the book, by the way, is brilliant. So check out her site, check out the book, check out our podcast episode, go see her at Litquake. Um, okay. Guys. Let's talk about Litquake. Yeah. How are you feeling, Ali? Are you feeling good about yourself? Yeah, I'm building yeah. I'm <laughs> on the ceiling right yeah. now. Thank I feel you. like we should be flashing her URL right on the screen. <laughs> Is it aliavolts.com? Yeah. Call yes, now. Okay. Call now. Call now. 1 800 aliavolts. Um, but, but, but you should be floating on the scene because we're both completely sincere in what we're saying. So, so thank you for that. All right. But let's talk about the event. Let's talk about Lit Quake. Enough of Alia. My God. This is not, she already had her episode. Let's talk about Lit Quake. Uh, so 80 events, 300 authors. I guess you, you, you've touched on this a little bit, Jack, but can you tell us just a little bit more about, and I don't know, you can tell me if there's not a lot more to say, but I'm just, I just, I'm always interested in the process and how you come up with the programming, who chooses the authors. Um, can you tell us maybe a little bit more about that? Uh, sure. Some of it is, um, you know, we, we ask people in the community to curate events. And so, uh, we have we have to find the right venue for them, right? Like uh, Alia's event uh, at uh, Kerouac Alley was originally going to be at Vesuvio, and we figured out a way to put it outdoors and bring in a sound system. And uh, you know that's that's one sort of model. Another sort of model is uh, us, you know, working with the Urbana Gardens Festival to do an outdoor stage there. And uh, you know, one day we we put together uh, four authors. Uh, and, and diverse literary communities and told everyone, you have an hour, put it together, bring in whoever you want. And so, you know, it was, it's going to be great. And, uh, and then the next day, the next afternoon, um, we went and invited people who typically do the lit crawl, but also uh, have uh, strong um, audiences in, uh, in the literary scene. So the same thing, you know, it, rather than individuals, we asked uh, Moad, and Nomadic Press to cur curate an hour. We asked uh, a Black Freighter Press with uh, Tongo, oh, Eisen yeah. Martin. We asked uh, uh, Diasporic Vietnamese uh, uh, Artists Network, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. So that whole day is curated by local organizations. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's outdoors. And I think maybe five poets, most of it's poetry um, each hour. And it's it's going to be, you know, all day long. So you can just sort of walk in and walk around. Um, so that that's one way of working it. and more traditional ways that you just look through book catalogs beginning, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the fall before Liquid. You know, you hear of a hot title and then you uh, go to this website called Idle Vice, which mm -hmm. is what everybody in the book industry uses to sort of uh, find um, publishers Alice. catalogs get posted there and you can read through them. And it's um, incredibly cumbersome and idiotic and the way it's organized. And uh, I think everyone will agree that I've talked to in the industry. It is just monotonously so frustrating. So, so then we, we identify which books are coming out that we'd like uh, uh, or be interested in for Liquid. And then we you know, work with the publicist. We find out who the publicist is attached to that title. And then the publicist, uh, you know, if it's a hot book, usually they're like, okay, what are you, what's your audience? How many books are you going to sell? How, how much can press can you do? Blah, 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 blah. And then you find out that, you know, you as Liquid are competing against other organizations in the same time frame for mm -hmm. the full tour. So then you have to be very inventive uh, in order to get that. And, you know, some authors we, we just realize we'll never get. And we don't want to. I don't want Salman Rushdie as Liquid, you know? The guy does enough events, right? Okay? Right. You know, just go to any book festival in the world, and there's Salman Rushdie <laughs> one more time. Uh huh. You know, and uh, it's not that interesting. If you want to find authors like that uh, at a festival, just go on YouTube. There's a million videos of Salman Rushdie somewhere, uh, you know, uh, appearing in a live context. Right. Uh, don't waste your breath going to a festival and going to Salman Rushdie. <laughs> enough Salman, Salman Rushdie has enough fans. Okay. Not bitter at all. I'm not, not bitter at all. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, if, I don't know if I would turn it down, but it's very unlikely he would agree. Uh, yeah. Also, you have to pay a, an exorbitant speaker's fee to someone like Salman Rushdie. So, so that uh, you know, a, a little festival like us, we can't pay one author thirty thousand dollars to appear for an hour. You know, you would sell a thousand dollars worth of tickets, and what's the point of that? Right. Uh, 
But that's interesting to me. It's interesting to me that there's competition amongst the festivals because I would think if I were a publicist and there were, let's say there was a festival, I mean, because Litquake goes on for, what is it, two weeks? It's 16 days. 16 days, right? So it's two weeks, more than two weeks. So I would. I would think that as a publicist, I would be like, uh, I can't say Salman. I would be like, you know, whomever we were going to get you at Litquake this this day. And then we're going to fly you down to L.A. for this. And then we're going to fly. And maybe it's I'm saying if there are things going on at the same time. But is there is there the publicist looking for some sort of exclusivity? I mean, tell me a little bit more about the competition. If, if it was up to the publicist, they would have five events in San Francisco in five days. Uh-huh. And right, uh, it would cannibalize all of the audiences and nobody would get a full house. So. It's up to all the venues and the organizers like us to, uh, to ask for radius clause. We don't want any other event within two or three months that's in the same uh, geographic. geographic. So, uh, yeah, and, you know, you're and it's not just other festivals. It's uh, it's speaking, you know, tours like um, the Commonwealth Club. Right. Uh, right. Uh, Jewish Community Center. Um, Arts, City Arts and Lectures. City Arts and Lectures is the big one. Right. Um, so there's there's a lot of competition. Kepler's in, uh, in the South Bay. There's uh, places up north in Copperfields, and right. uh, you know, so everybody's if there's a big book coming around, everybody's you know throwing ideas at the publicist, and and she just sort of like picks and chooses what's going to be the most valuable for the author. But um, so yeah, you know, yep. you have to sometimes you have to have a uh, uh, a wrestling memoir event. You know, because nobody else is going to do that. Nobody else is going to do that. Not not a lot of those going on. I think you, yeah, you got the corner on the market on those. So Ali, uh, Jack was just talking about most of what he was talking about was Litquake, um, you know, doing outreach. What if I am an organization and I want to hold an event or what as just me as an author, as an individual, I'd like to somehow get on a panel or participate in one of the events. And I'm not necessarily being asked. Maybe I'm not affiliated with one of those organizations that might otherwise ask me. Are there ways that as an organization or as an individual, I can approach Litquick and try to uh, try to make something happen, Alia? I actually think Jack is going to be the best person. To but I'm asking you. Theory. Yeah, but I'm asking but, you. No, no, I'm uh, well, we, we, have a, we have an online <laughs> submission process, but um, if you know Alia or just walk up to her. You know? Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it is really uh, in, in San Francisco. And, and I think that, let me see, how do I, how do I put this? Uh, San Francisco can be a little bit uh, a fraternal or, or ancestrous. It's part of being a small town, a small community. It's, it's part of um, the whole process being very community-based uh, that it does, it, you have to make yourself known to the people who are organizing these things. So with the way that Litquake works, it's kind of a trickle down situation. So uh, maybe Litquake taps several dozen people in the community who they say see as people who know people who would be interested in right. reading or who would be interesting to bring to light. And then it's kind of up to those community organizers to find the people from within their little micro scenes, because it is like, the way that the way that because they're, because it's a small community in a small town, there are the scenes and then the micro scenes. So if I want to find uh, if I want to find poets in Oakland, I think of about five people. I'm not going to know all the newer poets, but I'm going to know five people who will know the newer poets who go to all the readings in the East Bay and who are really involved in that scene. Right. So you 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 figure out who are the people who kind of know who. Do, who's who's interesting, who's new, who maybe deserves uh, more of a spotlight than they're getting. Um, I'm hesitant to put it that way because it really makes it sound like an insider's club. And in a way, perhaps it is. But but it's kind of it, it is an in, it is an effective way of tapping into the micro scenes. Right. If you have yourself as a, as an as an author as an organizer, if you have an idea for an event or you have a micro scene, you know me and all me and my ten friends, we do this. We get together every other week and we do this thing that's kind of different from what everything else is going on. Then you approach Litquake through the portal with a proposal. Here's what here's what we want to do. Um, I, I do know that this year and last year because of the challenges of the pandemic, it's had to be, it's had to shrink down a lot. And so uh, it's, it seems entirely possible that some people are disappointed by not getting their panels or their readings accepted um, 
even if they have in the past. And, and people just have to understand that this is a this is an organizational nightmare and everybody is doing the best they can. Right. It has to be smaller. <laughs> right. So just right. Ask. Yeah. Thank you for so, saying that. That's uh, I feel really bad that we just didn't have room for everybody. It's yeah. uh, it's you know, the festival is a third the size that it has been in the past. And so, you know, in years past, we were always sort of um, very able to sort of absorb a lot of people locally to, to, you know, put them in a festival alongside these national and international headliners. And uh, yeah, it's just, um, you know, with the venues and being closed and everything, it's, uh, we can only do so much. If I may, I'm one of the people who hasn't got to read the past couple of years this year or last year, but I did get to read the two couple of years and I, or the two, two years before those two years. And I emceed the accidental event that you guys had uh, with WordSpace with Naomi. And, um, but so point being, when I didn't get to read this year or last year, I just understood. So I think I think if if I were you, if I may speak on behalf of all those people who have participated in the past and don't get to participate currently, like I think most people probably get it. You know, it didn't. I, it, there was not even a moment where I was like, "What? I don't get to read this year." I was just glad you guys were having the event, and I suspect I'm speaking for most most past participants um, when I say that. But let's talk about Jack. Tell me if if I'm thinking about coming to the festival and I'm not sure yet, we are going to talk about the specific programs and, and lit crawl and the writing panels. But just give me some of the headliners just to give me or, or some of the some of the um, other other people who are going to be there that I might want to uh, to come see if I'm not already familiar sure. with the program. Well, we were because it's a pandemic, we were able to get a lot of people doing virtual events and some of them uh, were professionally shot on video in advance. So, for instance, uh, Isabel Allende, you know, we we went to her secret office in uh, <laughs> um, Marin County and um, and, you know, and did an event uh, in, in partnership with the Cheltenham Literary Festival over in England. And, um, you know, we did uh, Dave Eggers did a, a, a video shoot at Treasure Island with uh, T. Bowie to talk about his new novel. Um, we're doing a virtual event. Um, it's it's pre-recorded also with. Um, uh, the director of this new film about Truman Capote, this do- new documentary about Truman Capote, and uh, Tony Bravo from the Chronicle uh, did the interview. It's a great, great interview, uh, and that's that's pre-recorded. Um, and there are there are a few others: uh, Brandon Hobson and uh, Tommy Orange. Um, you know, very very uh, lucky to get both of them. But it was it was easier because uh, they did not have to travel here or stay here. So. Uh, so there's those sorts of events. And then there's also um, one of the biggest events that we uh, are getting advanced registration for is a poetry series at um, Grace Cathedral. Mm. We've used that space for years and years. And it's a perfect place for poetry. And uh, the poet D.A. Powell is also a professor. Um, he curated, he's super good at curating and uh, finding people from all up and down the West Coast and forcing them to travel to San Francisco to do, uh, to do that event. With, uh, and, and Doug hosts it, and it's great. It's like every single year, you, you, you wonder who he's bringing, you know, right. because it's always a very inventive um, and very popular, you know, sort of, uh, sort of event. Um, let's see, uh, we... We are doing a, a bunch of international stuff. They have to all be on Zoom. We've done this in the past. It's a lot of coordination of flying authors from other countries in, working with various consulates and um, translation presses. But uh, this year, it's going to be all virtual. So we will have people live. Um, uh, with, the programs are during the daytime, but they'll be live from uh, Europe, Sweden, Norway, Germany, uh, Mexico City. Uh, the island of Mauritius mm-hmm. in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the author has written a new novel about uh, um, a, a murder that took place in uh, in the community uh, some years ago of a musician. So, so those are all uh, you know. Our international programs are are, are live. Like right. none of them are pre recorded. Mm-hmm. It's kind of interesting that the authors would like. No, no, no. I'll wait. I'll stay up till eleven. You know, and and yep. do your festival. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's um, worth their while, apparently. So those are uh, those are kind of, you know, uh, interesting um, sorts of things. Uh, there are some we've partnered with the Yerba Buena neighborhood to do a lot of our events. They they were able to get us access to a lot of the buildings there. So 
we will be doing events at the American Bookbinders Museum. I think we have four nights there, uh, the Contemporary Jewish Museum, the Children's Creativity Museum. And then there's also a venue called, um, well, in the outdoor area too. And then there's also a, uh, a jazz lounge called the Local Edition, which is in a basement and it's, uh, it's a building downtown and it's um, the basement of the Hearst building where they used to actually print the Hearst newspapers. Mm-hmm. So you go into this bar in this lounge and the floor is wooden and there are old printing presses there and all this memorabilia around it. So, so we'll be doing a, a I've a actually been there. Yeah. Show. Yeah, yeah. I've been there. I forgot about that place. Okay. A couple of things that jumped out at me when I was looking that I just want to mention really quickly. And then we're going to talk about the aspiring writer panels. Um, I always love the porch light series and I know Charlie Jane Anders is going to be there and she's actually my next guest on the podcast. She's got two great books out, which is greater than death and never say you can't survive. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. There's also one reading, writing robots, AI and literature. I'm so kind of freaked out about artificial intelligence and coming right. into the literary right. world. So I, right. I, that one st- stood out as one that would be interesting. Yeah. And then you just mentioned poetry and uh, the revolution poeticized with Tongo Eisen Martin, San Francisco poet laureate, who was also on my podcast. I love my conversation with him, but I also loved, um, and he's going to be with Imani Cezanne, Daria Simpson and Mimi Tempest. I don't know if you guys, I'm guessing, if you haven't seen people watching and listening, uh, if you haven't seen Tongo's Poet Laureate inauguration, check it out on YouTube. It was so powerful. Um, I was bawling for half of it and uh, laughing at the other. I mean, it was just so great. So anyway, I'm sure that that event is another one that's going to be great, especially for people interested in poetry. But um, Alia, let's talk about you. Uh, one of your responsibilities as you have come on board is the Aspiring Writer Panel. So can you tell us a little bit about, about what those are? Sure. Uh, so Liquake has two days of panels, uh, as as it has, I believe, every year. This is a this is for many years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for many many years. And uh, and I I came on board to help organize some of those. So Saturday, October 9th is the sort of uh, craft day. There's a great panel on crafting the short story. It's got with Grant, Grant Faulkner and Ethel Rohan and some other folks. There's the novel panel um, also with, let me see, that's Carol Edgardian and and Naomi Manuira, who's always so delightful and interesting. And then I'm leading a a memoir panel called Blood is Thicker Than Ink. And it's specifically about the trials, tribulations, uh, lawsuits, and pleasures of writing about family. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, and, And we have... Myself, Lily Danziger, Marie Mutsuki Mockett, and Roberto Lovato, whose memoir, Unforgetting, was super tremendous last year. Yeah. So that's the craft day. And then Sunday, the 10th, is kind of more on the business side of things. Uh, one of the panels is to, to MFA or not to MFA. And it's, it's a debate with two people who didn't take the MFA path and two people who did. I love that um, idea. I saw that that was on the, on the schedule. And I thought that's just such a great idea. I've talked with a couple of writers about that because I've had questions myself, you know, should I have done it? Should I have not? So I think that's a great, a great topic to, to tackle. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually on that panel because I'm very opinionated about this. <laughs> the same about most things. Okay, so, uh, there's another episode, I think. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that should be really interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing both sides. There's the ABCs of literary journals. And um, this, is, this is, I believe, with Oscar Villalone and some other, other folks who are really involved in the literary journal world. And then we have launching into a shit storm, which is the debut author panel. And these are all people like me who launched their debut books in what is, I think, inarguably the weirdest year we've ever had for debuts. And and so we'll be talking about um, the ins and outs of how to actually accomplish that. And it's a range of, of people with very with major pub presses and people with smaller presses and and hybrids and how everyone has pulled that off. Uh, so and all of weird. all of these like- are at the Contemporary Jewish Museum. Yes, these are all at the Contemporary Jewish Museum. They are indoors with vaccines checked at the door and masks required. Okay. And then you're doing something outdoor, which Jack, I think already alluded to or touched on briefly in the alley outside yeah. of Vesuvio. Do you want to tell us quickly about that? Of course. Uh, Straight No Chaser Writers at the Bar has been going for, it must be almost 10 years now. Longer it, than that. Kind. 
So it was originally Alan Black for speaking of the Edinburgh uh, Edinburgh uh, Tavern, Edinburgh yeah. Castle. Castle. So yeah. This was this was his baby, and then I inherited it at a point. And it's always it's usually at Vesuvio, and we read over the balcony, um, kind of proclaiming from the balcony. And it and and it tends to be edgy, sexy, funny, weird, dark work that people will listen to in a bar and pay attention to. Um, and it's a lot of fun. This year, for safety, we're doing it in Jack Kerouac Alley outside. Vesuvio is serving drinks. City Lights is selling books. Um, it's still got that you know, rootsy San Francisco vibe. And just for shits and grins, it, it is entirely people who, sorry. People your who kitchen door, it. Ali, your it's kitchen, kitchen door. door. I don't know if you need to yeah. check the kitchen door. Yeah, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Um, <laughs> the, the lineup is entirely composed of people who launched books in 2020 and didn't get to have any goddamn fun. So mm. for most of us in this lineup, this is our first live reading. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. Fantastic. Um, okay, Jack, let's talk about, because you do do so many other things as well. Um, one is lit. Kid Quake, rather. Can you just give us the the, the quick lowdown on, on what Kid Quake is for those who might have kids and be interested? Sure. In uh, normal times, Kid Quake uh, was hosted at the San Francisco Public Library main branch and school uh, classrooms would take buses or take BART and bring their kids on field trips to come and hear children's authors and do workshops. And that was two full days. And uh, last year, we actually, well, we had to do it all virtually, but we were able to reach 2,000 more children mm -hmm. in the school system than we could doing live events because budgets were so often cut and you know teachers didn't have the money to take kids out on a field trip. So now we are going to be, um, we, we pre-recorded all of our children's author stuff and 76 <laughs> classrooms from the Bay Area and actually beyond the Bay Area will be um, showing them for their, uh, for their students. I love it. That's, That's pretty cool. Yeah. And then so that's on the on the early stages of life end of the the spectrum. But then you also do something that I also just love on the other end of our life spectrum, which is the elder project. Can you tell us about that? Uh, sure. This was um, started by someone on our committee who had worked with elders in the past. And um, Jane was also interested in starting uh, some sort of track of our programming that, uh, that catered to elders to bring people into uh senior facilities and uh, and teach them how to read and not just reading at them, but teach them how to write uh, their own stories. And so this has been going on for, I don't know, maybe four or five years. Um, we, uh, we get uh, the, you know, often the Zellerbach Foundation or some other group will fund it, the California Arts Council, and and we hire teachers and we bring them into these uh, facilities. No, it's, they had to do it on Zoom for the last two years, but uh, um, and we'll be doing, uh, we always try to feature the, the all-star students from the previous year in the festival. And so, uh, yeah, the Elder Project gets its own event in the festival. And, um, and they're great. I've gone to some of the live things, the live mm -hmm. events that they host. And uh, it's great to see, like, somebody 80 years old get a huge round of cheering right. from the audience when they read, uh, you know, some, some piece they've written about, you know, their life 70 years ago. It's great. Right. And then each class was publishing an anthology. I'm not sure if you said this. Um, I don't uh, know if you still elders, do that. Yes, the elders. Do. Yes, yeah. We still which, do that. Right. Which Everybody is, gets a, yeah, it's a which is great. Okay. And then you have a new program, the last program that, that we'll touch on. And I don't know if you know about it, this, Ali, or if this, if I should stick with Jack on this one, uh, the Lit Quake Out Loud. Who stick would with like? Jack. Let's stick with Jack on this one. Jack, would you like to tell us about your new program? Uh, this has been going for a couple of years now. And we, um, we, we wanted to make a concentrated effort to um, to engage all the voices of the community and to raise enough money to hire people to curate events. And so the uh, the first time we did this was last year, uh, unfortunately, and it had to be virtual, but it was amazing. It was amazing what everyone brought to the table. Um, uh, you know, Tongo was, was part of it. Uh, there were, there were like so many great events. There was, Somebody, I don't know how they did it, but they shot it live outdoors and it was somewhere and there's a sidewalk and there's a woman, um, you know, who's basically like nude reading poetry and burning sage and waving it around. And, uh, <laughs> and we were we were all running these Zooms, you know, just stuck at our little uh, wherever we were doing it. And we we're like, oh, wow, I wasn't quite <laughs> expecting that, you know, um, but it was it, they were all. Um, uh, very heartfelt and it was not 
the kind of programming we would have uh, created. Right. Which is yeah. the point. Without, right? without, and that was the entire point. Of it. Right. And um, yeah, it was, uh, we, we we're doing it again this year and this year it's on uh, live on stage. So okay. you know, everyone can see them. Okay. And they'll all be nude. I think is what you said. A lot of nudity, a lot of sage. A lot yeah. of nudity and sage. Yeah. A perfect, I mean, perfect I just combination. Want to circle back, uh, Matthew. When uh -huh. one you mentioned was about uh, AI and robots. Yeah, this is something we've been wanting to do for some time. And there is actually a festival here in the Bay Area called the Grid, which is a confluence of several different organizations putting their resources together, including uh, um, European consulates, um, the Gray Area um, art art space, and the Mission uh, City Lights was involved, and the Goethe Institute in particular. Um, here in San Francisco. And so uh, I just kept pestering them to help us put together an event until it finally came together. And, you know, their, their festival is all about AI, but they had this tiny little one or two events about literature and the future of writing through artificial intelligence and right. the ethics of it, the practicalities of it. Um, we had done events in the past that were AI related, but they were always comedy shows at a bar. <laughs> you know, there'd be like a group of smart asses from Chicago and they would like enter in, um, you know, somebody's uh, uh, famous speech, like the Abe Lincoln's famous speech, you know, and then um, a McDonald's menu and mash those together and read it out loud. Right. I mean, it was very entertaining, but it was it was it's just the tiniest uh, uh, I took the iceberg of AI and literature. And so. Yeah, we, this one's going to dig pretty deep. It's um, uh, already has a ton of reaction from people who don't ordinarily go to literary festivals, I'm guessing. And this is really ticking their box, yeah. as it were. I hate to say that word. Ugh, yeah. I yeah. That. Cliche. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, so there you have it. Yeah. Okay. So that's, so thanks for, thanks for going a little deeper with that one. That, that's interesting. I, I'm both fascinated and frightened by that whole concept. So, and I think that's probably why it's eliciting such a response, right? I'm probably not the only one having that sort of reaction. Right. Okay. And I don't understand it either. I mean, I don't, I've had the yeah. event description like six times and I'm still not sure exactly what it's about. <laughs> I, I don't know. Is that good marketing? I guess, I guess that's, if they're, they're, they're making you question, you want to go find out, I guess that's, I guess that's good. And we'll, we'll, I, we'll, we'll know what that was afterwards. Um, <laughs> But uh, but let's let's talk now as we as we come to the end of our hour, let's talk about the climax of the festival, which is Lit Crawl. This is how I found I mean, I live in the mission, so it takes place in the mission. This is how I first heard about Lit Quake. And I assume that it's how a lot of people probably do, because it's such a visible event, especially if you live in this neighborhood. You cannot miss, obviously, that it's happening the night that it happens. So, Alia, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, Lit Crawl is? Oh, goodness. Lit Crawl has always, oh gosh, it's just always been so much fun. Um, in in the before times, there would be three, four hundred uh, events going on during the course of three, four hours, something like that. And all over this neighborhood. And basically Lit Quake takes over the mission. And there's this, it's, it, it's sort of like a bar crawl, except that it's gigantic and it's all about literature. And uh, one of the most wonderful things we were talking about how Litquake, you know, will give a curator a space to, to bring together voices from their own subculture and community. And so Litquake has been this really magical moment where those curatorial efforts come together with Litquake's kind of wild planning. And you get this, you get this tremendous thing where like, like the, the event in, in the laundromat, I think was, former was sex workers airing dirty laundry in a laundromat. <laughs> uh, if I, it, that one just There's stuck something like mind. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's the whole retail corridor and you start in one place and then it moves to the nearest and moves to the nearest. And um, so of course it's, it's gotta be a little bit different in the COVID era. And I'll let Jack talk more about what those changes are. Um, but it, it really is just such such a unique and beautiful time. And it's the night that you go out into the mission, or I guess it's, I don't know if it's even in the mission right now. Um, anyway, you go out yeah. to where the crawl is happening and you're going to see all your literary friends you're going to run into in the street. And, it, and, it, and I'm super excited for it, especially this year, because I haven't seen anybody in two years. 
you know, right. and this is where the, those magical encounters happen on the sidewalk. And then, and then you duck out and get a burrito and go, go to more readings and you'll walk, you'll be walking plat, past and not even plan to encounter something exciting and moving and different. So the serendipity factor is I think highest at the lit crawl. Um, and, and I've made some wonderful connections and been turned on to whole new styles of writing mm -hmm. really from wandering into some event that I have, he's just like, I wonder what this is. Yeah. I have a great example of that. Again, this is th the third time we're mentioning Tongo at least, but just to mention Tongo again, I went to a poetry event because my friend was, uh, was reading in the event and this guy gets up and just blows, <laughs> blows everyone away. And I didn't know who he was, right. This was a few years ago. And, um, and then I ended up, you know, when I saw that this guy is getting, just got named San Francisco Port Laureate, I said, wait, I know him, you know, and um, you do, you get so much such exposure. And like you said, and just you stumble upon things ordinarily you might not stumble upon because something you didn't mention that that's worth noting, I think, is that it happens in three phases. So there's so much to choose from. Mm -hmm. But um, Jack, do you have anything to add about about Lit Crawl? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Alia was so eloquent. She was. Uh, and she was. Describing all of it. Um, I will say that we have about 30 events this year and that's, you know, a fraction of what it typically is. Right. And we're not using as many venues because some of them are, are closed, mm -hmm. unfortunately, mm -hmm. or they, uh, they are skittish about having a bunch of word nerds crash into their business and pack it in. But it's I still up and down Valencia. It still is up and down Valencia. Correct. Yes. And uh, I'm still amazed, you know, that what would pack a venue at the lick crawl. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there are people you've never heard of, but maybe it's a slice of a genre that you've never even, you're not familiar with at all. And they were always crowded. Mm -hmm. uh, we did one event in a parking lot for Bark Magazine and every reader had dogs and they were <laughs> filled with dogs. <laughs> you know, just things like uh -huh. that coming uh -huh. to mind over the years. And, you know, we've done readings in the vibrator store and the police station and a lot of very unorthodox uh, venues that uh, all had mentioned the laundromat, not so much this year. I think it's kind of a rebuilding year. Let's just be optimistic and regroup, see each other. And uh, we have an outdoor uh, parking lot stage uh, for all three phases of the lick ball this year. But um yeah, again, we, there wasn't room for everybody, and we sort right. of had to uh, make some accommodations. But well, uh, let me mention it's definitely happening. Yes, and let me let me mention just again, just this is just a a selection of 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 the events of the lit crawl events that jumped out at me, just to give people who aren't already familiar with it an idea of this year's sort of variety. There's uh, and this, these weren't even necessary. These are just the ones that jumped out at me. A literary relay race with Castro Writers Cooperative. I just did this last weekend at at Lit Camp. We did this and I went on their retreat. And somebody writes 150 words. You hand it off to the next author. They write 150 words. You hand it out to, off to the next author, and it's Hilarious. At least ours was absolutely hilarious. So that, I'm sure that will be fun. Cleavage Collective. Cleavage will entice you with sex, death, drugs, Southern hometowns and music by alternating readers piece by piece. That sounds fun. Essential Truths, the Bay Area in Color. This, these are readings from contributors to the anthology of the same name, which features 130 BIPOC writers, poets and artists reflecting on the Bay Area realities. Organ music dispatches from our insides. And as someone who wrote a book about my experiences in bathrooms throughout the world, this one really resonated. The description says bodies gurgle, rumble, and leak. They channel ecstasies and metabolize histories. So this is these are readings from workshop group of writers from the Ruby related to the glorious, brilliant, messy, and strange human body. So again, that sounds fun. Not for the faint of heart, I suspect. And then uh, 826 quarter the release reading will be uh, will happen. Uh, Ziziva, Fall all, all Stars will happen. Here's the future you requested, sci-fi, uh, fantasy, and fantastical prose. And then Noir at the Bar with the Mystery Writers of America. Um, so again, I just tried to kind of show there's such a variety. There, there really is. Talk about cliche, but there really is something for everyone, I think. So nice job with the programming, especially given all the challenges. Um, let's talk just quickly because we are coming to the end, unfortunately, but let's talk quickly about um, your business model. I mean, how, where's the funding come from and how can people help with the funding? <laughs> it used to come uh, from ticket sales uh -huh. in olden times. Um, 
when we would rent venues and then we would have to charge money to at least pay for the venue. And then maybe we would be able to uh, run our own bar and then sell donated booze and try to make it that way. So, so you know, all that's out the window with COVID. Nobody will pay for a Zoom. I mean, and if you are, you're like, why? You know, there's, uh, <laughs> there's so many other uh, ways you can watch that same person for free. Yep. Um, I think people's spirit of uh, philanthropy is very different now. Um, we, uh, we received uh, a, a much more donations last year for our virtual festival than we ever dreamed. We, mm-hmm. we were uh, shocked at how generous people were. So there's that. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, uh, some corporate sponsorship. There's definitely a lot of foundation um, uh, funding that's available uh, and grants from uh, government entities like uh, California Arts Council, um, Grants for the Arts, San Francisco Arts Commission, all these sorts of uh, groups that are out there. And, um, you know, sometimes it just comes out of the blue. Mm-hmm. Last year, this is so weird, we got a $20,000 grant from someone who preferred to remain anonymous. And it was a P.O. box in Menlo Park. And nobody knew, what the hell? Who is this person? We Uh couldn't even thank them. We like Uh wrote a note to the P.O. box. Like, I don't know. And yeah, I don't know if it was just some uh, techie with a a momentary lapse of reason and decided to give money to to an arts organization. I have no idea. Very odd. Very mysterious. Awesome. Um, you know, so the, the it's a variety of ways. And we ask people to donate online as they begin to register for, for the event. Um, and we will have donation buckets as we've had in the past. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, th- we don't live in a European country where the arts are so much better funded. Um, we live in America where you're, you know, you're told to uh, uh, tough it up, you know, suck it up. Right. Oh, arty farty. Right. Oh, arty know. farty. Suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> They're definitely, uh, they don't make it easy in the United States. I mean, there are, there is a, 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 um, an incredible level of ger- generosity from the federal and the state government because of COVID in general and particular to the arts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it gets distributed in strange ways sometimes, but um, yeah, you know, it's sort of, if you work in the arts, it's this ongoing uh, sort of thing that you always have to encounter. I don't doubt it. And then one other way that you guys uh, function, and I'll let Alia talk to this, is is the volunteers. Alia, can you talk a little bit about uh, the volunteer side of things? Um, or Jack? If- Should Jack talk um, about that uh, one? You know, Alia's, uh, uh, Alia's sort of always been a lone wolf with the organization. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh-huh. He's always like, you know what, I'll just do the bar thing. You know, I'm not going to come to your little meeting, so I don't need to. Uh, and frankly, she doesn't. You know, she's now she's a well-established, best-selling author uh, of a memoir. And so, uh, you know, she's she is now like one of the people that we work with in the community to, right. to that help us curate the thing. The, uh, the volunteers are, you know, people of all, uh, uh, all over the Bay Area who just sign up online and then yep. they get to work events and then get to see the events for free. You know, so they can work the door, they can sort of, uh, you know, handle a, a green room or turn down the volume or something, it's whatever. It's just kind of a, a, a variety of things. And, you know, these are just literary events. This isn't brain surgery we're doing. You know, there's a like, turn the lights on, turn the sound on, you start talking. That's really it. I mean, you know, and make sure to, you know, pick the stuff up afterwards and, uh, and be nice to the authors because, you know, they're in public and they're a little skittish. Sometimes be nice. You know, be nice to the our authors. Social skills are uh, not not as uh, uh, fluid as others. You know. Right. Right. Jack, Alia, thank you so much. So, Jack, can you remind us in closing uh, when Litquake takes place? Not sure. <laughs> does anyone? <laughs> does anyone have a flyer? Wait. Shoot. <laughs> does anyone have a flyer? Let me look online. I'll look online. Uh, it's, uh, October seventh through the twenty third. Okay. Uh, Two thousand twenty one. Two thousand twenty one. And, and the Lit details crawl. are at litquake.org. Is and, for, um, yeah, everything. Follow us on social media. There's tons of stuff coming out all the time. And uh, all the authors and everybody's beginning to share all their uh, their graphics and things. So, um, yeah, we hope to see you there, you know, live or virtually. 
live virtually however you can get there get to lit quake online in person both whatever it is right. uh, do it oh you can stream you can watch it on uh facebook live too uh, okay. not that i want to give the z-man any more uh attention but it was an easy sort of button to click to to, to stream so all the virtual stuff will, you can also watch on our facebook page all right yep alia thank you very much looking thank forward you. to the 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 What's it? The aspiring writer panel? Did I say that? Was it aspiring writer panel? Um, what are you calling this? No, you said that. What are you calling them? Wrong. Okay, yeah, <laughs> correct no, me. Always, correct always, me. Always, <laughs> always are the more aggressive of the panels. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Tell me what the panels are called. I have okay. to scroll back up in my notes. I don't remember. Right. There, there is the craft day is is Saturday craft day. with talks about memoir, short stories, and novels. Sunday, there's more of the business side of it, uh, experiences launching books, how to get into lit journals, and whether or not you should spend enormous amounts of money to get an MFA. Get an MFA, which yes. I think we might have just gotten a sense for where Alia stands on that. I think. <laughs> She said she was opinionated, and I think some of that yeah. might have just come out. So right. she, she's I don't, no spoilers, no spoilers. But I think, I think we she just doesn't want it. you to join. She doesn't want you to sign up for an MFA program. But Alia does have a secret church that she's recruiting actively for people. And, yes, uh, you yes, need to give her a lot of money to be part of the church. But it's totally different. Totally well, I different. I feel like I need more information about my church, but. <laughs> well, you know what? You've got one. You've got plenty of time between now and your panels to come up with with the whole pitch for the church. And it's yeah. nice that Jack let you know that you've got a church that you... I don't I don't have a church, um, nope. <laughs> but I, I do. I do hope to see uh, folks interested in writing at these panels. We're going to have a full and uh, informative day and many opportunities to connect with the authors as well, as well as at events throughout the week. Come to Straight No Chaser, come to all of the other fabulous events. There's also the huge opening party on Friday night where uh, all the local luminaries will be out and dressed up. How right. dressed up do we have to get? Cause I'm going, I bought my ticket. How um, dressed up do we have to get? <laughs> dress, I would say just dress as if you've left the house. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, That's usually I would, about uh, as good as it gets. Also guess. just add that uh, we do have book sales at many of the live events. We may not have book sales at every single live event uh, because of COVID. It's impacted the book selling business quite a bit. So, but 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 you can always find all of the Liquid authors on our Bookshop account, and if you buy it through Bookshop, it will automatically connect you with an indie bookseller. Bookshop.org. Check out bookshop.org. All right. We have reached the end. Jack, thank you again for being here. I really appreciate thank you it. so much, Matthew. It's great. Alia, thank you again. Oh, and and uh, I'm Matthew Felix. More about me at matthewfelix.com. More about LitQuake again, litquake.org. And more about the San Francisco Writers Conference, including how to register for next year's in-person 2022 conference at sfwriters.org. Until next time, thanks for joining us. <laughs>